Beyond the Bio, hosted by Marty Lennertz. This Beyond the Bio segment is brought to you by Giordano's. Giordano's, we made it good, you made it famous. You've taught so many people over the years uh, about music, not just in, in at Columbia College in your classes, mm-hmm. but just from being on the air. You, you're you um, pretty much a, a, a person who has introduced so much music to people, and you've right. taught them about the context and the historical context. Yeah. I remember when we did the... Uh, one of one of the one of the anniversaries, for you. my seventieth, and, uh, and I and I talked with Studs Terkel, ah, yeah. and I wanted him to uh, oh, to say great. a few things about uh, about you and your career, and and one of the things he said is that uh, a DJ is a player of records, but you're so much more than that, and you have been over the years. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a huge Studs Terkel fan, too. He still calls me the hope of the future. I'm still a youngster <laughs> to him. <laughs> it's great. I love him. Uh, yeah, Studs is great. And uh, to me, music education is my life. That's really what I do. And uh, radio is one, one of the ways I do it. And the stuff I do with the Chicago Symphony is uh, another way. And Columbia College, of course. What I've do you do a, with the symphony? Uh, the Classic Encounter series. Tell us about that. Where I do a, uh, with Martha Gilmer, the CSO, we do a pre-concert lecture. It's a four-concert series, mostly like XRT types who are, uh, love music and adventurous music taste, but uh, feel a little intimidated by classical music, don't quite know what to wear, <laughs> how to act when they go to the symphony, or, or what to listen for. And we do a pre-concert, uh, we look them up a little bit, then do a pre-concert <laughs> lecture and uh, send them into the hall to hear some fantastic music. And, and I always tie in some contemporary music things, like once I compared uh, Moby to Bartok, and uh, about sampling, how Bartok sampled uh, Romanian folk music and Moby sampled Smithsonian recordings. And I told Moby that once, he about jumped out of his chair. He said, what did you say? How did you connect me to Bartok? He was so excited by that, you know? And of course, there's always a Beatle reference, which is quite easy because like when we did Brandenburg Concertos by Bach, played Penny Lane because uh, McCartney was watching a BBC performance of Brandenburg Concertos, saw that little Bach trumpet and loved the sound. And the next day, boom, there's Penny Lane. Wow. There aren't too many rock DJs who can uh, conduct a symposium on classical music. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. They want to do these with other symphonies, but they don't know of anybody that is... A little knowledge is very dangerous, and I take the, the knowledge that I have and <laughs> expound, you know. And, but I have to make it up each month. There's right. no book. There's nothing I can go to for reference, so I have to... Like one time I did a, a whiteboard thing where I traced contemporary... Mu- or, music from Gregorian chant, several stop-offs, to trip-hop. You know, it started with this like drone and then this lilting melody over it. Got into ragas, you know, Eastern music, and then it got to disco and everybody started laughing. I go, no, think, think Donna Summer, Giorgio Moroder, or I feel love, there's a techno <laughs> beat, and it's, I feel love, you know. And, and, it, and it all ends up with Portishead, you know, and, and wow. starting with Gregorian chant and going through jazz and, you know, Coltrane and Love Supreme and all this. And, but it's exciting for me to sit down and, and make this up. You know, to listen for connections, to think, okay, now, and some people come back season after season, so I can't repeat myself. So I have to, like, uh, unlike a Columbia where I can repeat myself every, no. Uh, I'm always trying to keep it fresh. But uh, it's, it's exciting for me as a music fan, a music educator, because to me, uh, if I can get people to listen to things outside of what their comfort zone is, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing as an educator, because I think music Opening up to other kinds of music helps you open up to other things. And you've been teaching at Columbia College now almost as long as you've been at well, thirty years, Over 30 years, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So That must... stays fresh, too. That, that keeps me going. In fact, sometimes, you know, you burn out if you do something for a long time. But school, I think, keeps me fresh when I go back into the studio the next day. It inspires me, even when the kids are being really crappy. I love that. I love being able to work with them because mm. the, the only thing I don't like about radio is uh, it's very isolating. It's like being a writer, because right. you're in, you know, when you're a writer, you, thousands of people read your book, and your radio, thousands of people listen, but you're alone. You're alone when you write, you're alone when you do the show, and that kind of gets to me after a while. That's why I love the classroom, because I mm. can interact with the kids, yeah. get feedback, hear from them, you know, and uh, so that, I think that keeps me fresh when I go on the air then, those outside projects. 
It must be pretty rewarding to uh, to be able to look back at your old student roles and see how many people are actually working and yeah. people that you inspired to uh, to get into this business and who have succeeded. Or even people that didn't get in the business. You know, I, to me, I, if I can enrich their lives, if I turn them into music fans, you know, that's great. Well, that was the cool thing about your class because it wasn't really a broadcasting class. Yeah, because It was I more of a music yeah. appreciation class yeah. and, and, uh, and you taught us how to put together a feature, how to mm -hmm. take a subject and, and surround it with music and present right. it. And, uh, you know, working at XRT, that class, that rock and soul class. Yeah, that helped. Where you made us get up in front of the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing a thing at Miles Davis. I had to do all that research and playing the music and telling, uh -huh. telling the kids in the class why this is important. Mm -hmm. That has, uh, has paid off so, so many times great, over the years. Great, great. Well, see, I was a speech major at Elmhurst. Yeah. And I learned that, and I, just public speaking did not come easy to me. When I took it in junior high, I was an embarrassment. The teacher was just thrilled that I got through the semester. And then when I came back years later and said, Miss Butcher, I'm majoring in speech. She went, you're kidding me. And, uh, but I said, the thing, if she could get a, an awkward, shy junior high kid to be able to get up in front of people, even though you feel like you're going to hurl, uh, <laughs> I mean, really, projectile vomit. It's that kind of nerve. I mean, you that's know? how the class was for me, too. Yeah, yeah right, right. Really sure, was. sure. And, and, to, and she drew me out and got me to be able to do that. I thought, if I don't make it in radio, because there was always that chance I'd have a fallback plan, I was going to be a speech teacher in high school. Because hmm. I thought, what a gift. If I could get kids to overcome that insecurity and that shyness and get up and, and still be nervous... I'm still nervous sometimes, you know. My kids don't, they don't uh, think that's true. But I said, oh, yeah, I still get certain situations. I'm, I'm terrified. But you just overcome the terror and let the adrenaline work with you instead of against you. And that's a wonderful gift. And I've had some kids at Columbia who've never had to get up and speak in front of a class before. And one kid even said she was going to have a seizure if she did. And we, you know, I said, well, do you have a note from your doctor or something? I, I even had to call the school lawyers to make sure I wouldn't get sued if I made her get up there and she had a seizure and hit her head and died. Uh, but anyway, uh, I talked to her on the phone for like 45 minutes, convinced her this was going to be really important. And I said, I don't care how well you do. I just want you to start it and finish it and do something in between. And then I can at least pass you because she was going to fail. Mm. She got up there and started really nervous. But the more she got into it, the better she got. And by the end of it, it was a whole new experience. And she came up at the end of the semester and said, this is the most important thing I've ever learned in my life, that I can overcome this fear and this anxiety, that I can do it, that, yeah, I'll be scared the rest of my life every time I have to do this, but I'm not going to have a seizure. Mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes we go through life feeling like we're going to have a seizure, and you know, it's just great to have a mentor or a teacher or a person come along and just sort of, yeah. sort of say, Marty, you'll be okay. You know, you can do this. You can get up and talk about Miles Davis. You'll be just fine. You can get into radio. You can, you know, the, the possibilities. No guarantees because it's a wacky business we're in and we're lucky we're working. But uh, just to give people some information and encouragement and, and even a sense of discipline sometimes when I have to, like, take the kids out to the woodshed and tell them they're not cutting it. Um, that's good, too, because I see kids turn around and make dramatic changes in their lives. You know, one kid said I was his wake-up call, hmm. you know, because I used the F word with him. I was so mad at him because he was sitting there with headphones on with his, uh, I think it was a Walkman. I think it was even before iPods and while well, I was lecturing. And I let him have it and pulled him aside later and said, what are you doing here? Let's work together. And he totally turned a corner. So stuff like that keeps me fed and going. Right. Stay tuned. More Beyond the Bio segments will be online soon.